Let's pray. Father, we're your people. And we come expecting that you will speak to our minds and to our hearts and to our hands and feet and vocal cords. Father, you know everybody in this place. You know the middle of the night when the demons come. You know the financial worries. You know the secrets we can't share and the sin we can't shake. But we're here. Meet us in this place. May we hear the soft sound of sandaled feet. And then, Father, as always, we pray for the one who teaches. Forgive him his sins, because there are many. We would see Jesus and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You've heard the illustration a number of times. It comes from C.S. Lewis, the lion and the witch and the wardrobe. And you remember Susan is in Narnia for the first time, and she's encountering all kinds of new things. And Mr. Beaver tells her that Aslan's on the way and that he's a lion. And Susan says, lion? I thought he was a man. I'm not comfortable with a lion. Is he safe? And the beaver says, of course he's not safe. He's Aslan. He's the king, I tell you. Do you know what I believe? And we can't help it. We do it all the time. But you know what I believe? I believe that a lot of our religion is an effort to make a God who is not safe, safe. I think sometimes the liturgy does that. Oftentimes the study of theology does that. Sometimes our prayers and our Bible studies are an effort to do something religious that will make God a little more safe than he really is. Listen, he's not safe. He's Aslan. He's the lion. Deal with it. Let me read you a great, great quote from one of my favorite authors. Her name is Annie Dillard, and I first encountered her by reading Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Tinker Creek is the place where she observes animals, and she said there are some animals that have a dead look in their eyes, and you eat them. And there are other animals that have fire and life and soul in their eyes. And that is a gift from God. She wrote another book called Holy the Firm. And in it, she says this, The higher Christian churches where, if anywhere I belong, come at God with an unwarranted sense of professionalism, with authority and pomp as though people in themselves were an appropriate set of creatures to have dealings with a sovereign God. I often think that all the set pieces of liturgy, that they are certain words which people have successfully addressed to God without getting themselves killed. In the high churches, they saunter through the liturgy like mohawks, along the scaffolding who have long since forgotten how dangerous it really is. If, if God should blast such a service to pieces, the congregation would be, I believe, genuinely shocked. But in the low churches, they expect it any minute. And that is the beginning of wisdom really is I'm out of control and I hate it it's not that I haven't tried to be in control I'm the son of an alcoholic 
And if you're the adult child of an alcoholic, you know that our issue is control. When things got out of control, we got into trouble. So we learned to control things. We learned to control people. We learned to control our churches. We learned to control friends. We learned to control our families. I teach communications, and I know that I'm a good talker. Do you know why I'm a good talker, even though my grammar's not very good? Because I learn to control people with words. I learn to solicit emotions from people by using the right words. I learn to communicate in a way that I can keep you in the distance and be in control. I have an image, a mask, if you will, of strength. When I stand before people, and you've got a deep voice like this, and it's a lot better than your voice. When you have a voice like this and you say, it's okay, people really believe it's going to be okay. And so you seem together and you seem spiritual and you seem to know what you're talking about. But underneath the mask, the warriors, a child, scared to death. But if you let people know that, you get out of control. And it's very dangerous. I had a reputation for leadership by intimidation in the churches that I served. And I'm not proud of this. I'm confessing it. I said to the elders in the last church that I served, look, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. I don't know a thing about running your bank, and so I'll try not to run it. And you don't know a thing about running this church. You try not to run that. You leave it up to me. Why did I do that? Because I was afraid I'd get hurt. I had to be strong. I had to wear the mask because I want to be in control. I'm confessing sin here, and I'm not proud of it. And the reason I'm comfortable in confessing this sin is that you're exactly the same way. Nobody likes pain. Nobody likes to be out of control. Nobody likes to have kids that are teenagers. Nobody likes to have a husband who is mean and a wife who's a dripping faucet. Nobody likes to have a job they don't like, and so we try to control it. Some do it with passivity being sweet and nice and carrying a 48. Some people, some people do it with words the way I do, in your face. If you push me, I'm going to push you back harder. If you debate me, you're going to be in trouble because I win debates regularly. I know what I'm talking about. It's all a mask because we want to be in control, and if it gets out of control, then we're in serious trouble. And then, and then there's God. Oh, my. I really believe the sweet, gentle Jesus that we portray, the God who's a grandfather who pats you on the back and stays up all night admiring you, the God who is the God of sweetness and light, we create that God. Some of you know I went to Boston University, graduate school, and I went there for a number of reasons. First, because they didn't believe anything, and I didn't either. They were just this side of wacko, liberal, theologically. But I also went there because Paul Tillich was teaching at Harvard, and I would be able, across the river, to go and hear Dr. Tillich's lectures. He was the mother of the God is dead movement. And he talked about God as being the ground of all being. And I used to make fun of that. Our ground of all being who art in heaven. And if you've ever been hugged by the ground of all being or forgiven by the ground of all being, well, in those days, I thought it was good. And then something happened to me, and I became one of you guys. And my theology became orthodox, and the Bible became true, and, and it changed my life to play off the old political slogan, once I was a liberal as happy as can be, now I'm a conservative, and I wish Tillich were a tree. <laughs> But I'm older now, and I look back, and I think I get something of what he was doing. 
I think he recognized what it took me a long time to recognize, that when you put a name on God, it is more often than not your name. And so ground of all being moves away from that. It calls us to worship a God who is really God, the God who is really there. Now, I would quibble with Paul Tillich about the God he worshiped. But nevertheless, he was on to something when he talked about the ground of all being. No, I'm not going to stop calling him Father, but I'm going to quit calling him Stephen. I'm not going to quit calling him Lord, but I'm going to stop calling him white, Anglo-Saxon, Presbyterian. You've got to be careful when you put a name to God because more often than not, that name ends up being your own name. Speaking of a God who can't be controlled, if you go to the third chapter of John, and you're familiar with it, if you, even if you're not sure of the reference, that's where Jesus tells Nicodemus he's got to be born again. And Nicodemus said, and it's in the original Greek, say what? And then Jesus says something that almost seems out of sync, a non sequitur. Jesus said, don't marvel. It's the wind. You hear the sound of it. But you don't know where it comes from, and you don't know where it went. And then when you move into the second chapter of Acts, the wind shows again. Now, I'm not going to read that whole chapter to you. There's some verses in it, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about it. The first verse of the second chapter of Luke, no, Acts, Luke was the author. I'm old. I'm doing the best I can, okay? Luke writes as follows. When the day of Pentecost arrived, and that was a religious festival, the festival of weeks, commemorating the time when God gave the law to Moses. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and they divided tongues, and divided tongues as if a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, and then when they spoke in tongues, people from various nations heard in their own language what was being said. Others looked at them and said, you know, they were at the bar last night. It's either a hangover or they're still plastered. And so when you, when you follow, you've got to go down to the 14th verse where Peter speaks to that issue. You know, it'd be good if Presbyterians acted like they were drunk sometimes. Maybe Jesus wouldn't leave the building so often. But listen to, listen to what Peter, but Peter standing with the 11 lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. And then, then Peter preaches this magnificent sermon. It's the gospel summarized, and it's not very pretty because he is clear about who did the killing and who was killed and what it cost. His name is Jesus. And then if you skip down to the 37th verse, Luke writes, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Now that's an attitudinal thing. Repent from a Greek word, metanoia. It means to change your mind. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, changing your mind. We're going to talk about controlling. We're not going to talk about becoming a quietist who lets go and lets God. There are things we got to do as human beings, as Christians, but what we do is that we give the reins to the God of the universe and let him control the direction of the horse. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
for the forgiveness of your sins, and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about three thousand souls. And then look what happened after that with God's people. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any who had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I'm out of control, and I didn't think I would be at this age. I've worked at this for a very long time, and frankly, I really thought I'd be better. You know, I really did. I mean, I get young hormones go uh, kill somebody because you're angry kind of thing, but I'm old. And I figured once I get that stuff out of my system, then I'm going to be better and better in every way, every day. And when I stand before God's people as an old man, I'll speak with great wisdom and purity and obedience and faithfulness, but it didn't happen that way. I kept trying to fix myself, and I wouldn't be fixed. I kept thinking it was going to get better, and it didn't get better. I kept thinking I would believe more deeply and more profoundly be obedient, and it just didn't, didn't work out that way. I really thought I was going to get better, and you did too. And so the beginning of wisdom is to recognize that there is a God and that that God is in control. So I decided that I would preach a sermon on the subject. And it wouldn't come together. You know, I've rewritten this thing four times. And I don't have that kind of time. This is hard work. Four times, no, five times I've rewritten this, and I still don't feel uncomfortable with it. And in the middle of the third or fourth rewriting, Eric Guzman, who's our vice president of communications at Key Life, came in and said, Steve, we got to record. I need seven short spots from you that we're going to put on talk shows around the country. And I said, sure. And I picked up the notes of this sermon. I figured I can get seven little vignettes out of a whole sermon, I sat down, and, I, and, and it was awful. We did 18,000 cuts, and it just wouldn't come together. And so, and so Eric turned on the speaker in the studio and said, Steve, I said, what? And he said, can I preach to you? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know what your problem is? You're doing the very thing you're preaching against. You're trying to control everything. You're trying to make a sermon and these small vignettes perfect and slick. You're trying to do it just right. Give it up. You can't control this. Go smoke your pipe in your study for a couple of minutes. Tell God you're sorry and come back in here and we'll do this again. I did, and the next time it was cool. And so I learned something. I'm going to share it with you. And the first is, when you give up trying to control yourself, your friends, your family, a sermon, or God, then the real God shows. 
I mean, this was the normal worship service. Everybody expected one thing, the God they had created and the real God showed and it scared the spit out of them. The rush of a mighty wind, fire and smoke. If you had been there, you would have gotten under the pew because the real God is the God you don't play around with. He is not safe. Ben Hayden, I loved more than I can tell you. Uh, for 35 years, we've been friends, and he died a couple of years ago. Do you know that everybody I quote nowadays is dead? <laughs> I got more friends in heaven than I do here. Well, anyway, Ben, uh, ben was there in some hard times in my life. He taught me about being strong. He said, if you're a pastor and you allow people to manipulate you, they'll think they can manipulate God, so don't let them. One time, and I followed Ben at the church that I served. He had served there, and the story got around, and I asked him if it was true, and he said, yeah, when he called the church treasurer into his office. He locked the door, and he put the key in his pocket. Now, Ben was not somebody you want to mess with. He had worked with the CIA. He had been a newspaper editor. He had been a lawyer. He did depositions at session meetings. And he said to this treasurer, sit down. He sat down. He said, we've got to talk. Both of us can't run this church. And when this meeting is over, one of us is going to, res going to resign. Just so you know, it wasn't Ben who resigned. Now, I don't know if that's a good way to lead. But it rang true with me, and you know why? Because God said something similar to me that way. Steve, you can't be God, and I be God at the same time. If you want to do it, you go ahead, but I'm leaving. You know why your devotions are so dead? You know why you sing the songs and they seem so empty? Do you, know, do you know why the joy that you experienced when you first became a Christian seems to have gone south? Do you know, do you know why sometimes you think, I don't even believe this is true anymore? Let me tell you, because you're controlling it. Because I'm controlling it. Because we're doing something that is way above our pay level. And so I've given it up. I like to say it's because I'm so spiritual. I think it's because I'm so old. I've given it up. I just, I haven't, I'm still trying to control. I'm still trying to grasp things. I'm still phony, but at least I know where the problem is. And God is becoming more and more real to me. And he's becoming real because the real God shows up when you quit playing God. Let me say it again. The real God shows up when you quit playing God. You think you're going to control your kids. You can't control teenagers. Deal with it. You think you're going to control your wife or your husband or your friends or your preacher? You think you're going to control yourself? Listen, that's way above your pay level. You've got to do what you've got to do. I'm not talking about quietism. That's an ancient heresy of the church by a Spanish mystic by the name of Molinas that says just sit and let God. I'm not talking about that. You still got to do what you got to do and be as faithful as you can, but you can't control it. Everything I try to control turns to ashes. Everything I try to grasp to myself dies. Everything I try to fix, and I'm a fixer, I try to fix everything turns sour on me. So once you give up, control of a sermon, of your life, of your friends, of your family, and of God, then the real God shows. Let me show you something else. When, when you give up control of God, family, sermons, kids, your job, your world, when you give up control of that and the real God comes, he's different than what everybody expected. 
Now, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it, but I kind of want to because uh, the Festival of Weeks is really kind of a cool celebration at Pentecost for the Jewish people. It's when the smoke came from Sinai and Moses received the law, do this and do this and do this. And at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and spoke through the apostle Peter, the sermon that he preached, it was the gospel of a God who loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You're kidding. What about all the work? What about all the law? What about all the religious stuff? And Peter said, repent, metanoia, change your mind, and run to Jesus. And it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. He'll love you. You know, we Presbyterians need to hear this a lot. You know, I drank coffee this morning from a mug given to me by Charlie and Ruth Jones. And the banner on the mug says, Presbyterian Gourmet Coffee, brewed decently and in order. We got to quit being so decent and so in order. You know, we, we, we need to have the kind of church where when the spirit moves, we giggle. You know, one of the reasons I love Jim Kennedy, he's dead too. <laughs> Jeez, man, it's getting kind of scary, you know that? <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm down at Coral Ridge a lot and preach there pretty often. Uh, and I love Jim Kennedy. Everybody thought he was sour and mean. He had a PhD. He said, go on. He was a part of the religious right. He had power, had a national television show. Everybody saw that side of him. I saw the other side of him because I was with him in a hotel room in St. Louis one time at 2 o'clock in the morning when we both got the giggles and the management of the hotel had to come to our room and tell us to be quiet. And so when Jim Kennedy would say, God, I would think of him giggling. When he would proclaim his political views, which by and large I agreed with, I would think of that hotel room and the manager saying, will you just be quiet? And then I saw why God used Jim because he had heard the gospel. And the gospel brings giggles at inappropriate times. The reason so many of us don't like the gospel when it's pure is because we'd rather do it ourselves. Just like me, you want to control. That's so true. The gospel says, give it up. You're a lot worse than you think you are. Give it up. You don't have the gasoline that it takes to do what's necessary. Give it up. You're trying to control it by being a good person. You're not a good person. You may become a better person when you get home, but you're not even close. Quit pretending. Give it up. Just give it up because when you give it up, the real God comes and he's a lot different than what they told us he would be. But, but there's one more thing. Well, I got two more points. My stomach just growled, so we're gonna, I'm going to end it as quite quickly as I can. Get something to eat. When you give up the control of your family, your friends, your job, your church, a sermon, or God, when you give up control, the lights go on. Please know what, I mean, this is not people you would pick to change the world. In the sixth verse of the first chapter of Acts, Jesus said, go back to Jerusalem and get prepared for taking over the world. He didn't say that. He said, he said I've carefully picked you guys, and you are gifted and bright and, and I want you to sit down and make plans for how you're going to win this battle. He didn't say that. He said, go back to Jerusalem and sit. And don't you move until the Holy Spirit comes with power. And that's what the second chapter is. Uh, the Holy Spirit coming with power. The best definition I know of control is when the lights go out. 
Notice, signs and wonders. Now, I'm not charismatic or Pentecostal. I do not speak in tongues. But that makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? We want to bring out our systematic theology and show why that ended in the first century. You know why we do that? Because it makes God safe. If one of you stood up and spoke in tongues this morning, especially if you were a liberal, an African-American, and a woman, we wouldn't know what to do with you because we expect the expected, decent and in order. And that's not what happened here. And then what happened? Signs. That's miracles. Wonders. How about that, sportsman? 3,000 people added to the rolls of the church after one sermon. Oh, my. So when you say, all right, I give it up. I ain't doing this anymore. I'm out of control. I can't fix myself. I can't fix anybody else. I can't fix anything. I give it up. At that moment, the Holy Spirit comes. And at that point, good stuff happens. And he gets the credit for it. I have a friend, he's dead too, <laughs> just Alan Emery, he was the chairman of the Billy Graham board, but anyway, he wrote a book, it was called Turtle on a Gatepost, he said, he said, when you see a turtle on a gatepost, you know he didn't get there by himself, that's what God is doing, taking people like you, not the smart ones, or the elite ones, or the rich ones, but people like me and people like you and doing unbelievable things because they're no longer in control. Just as an aside, when I used that illustration in a sermon one time and a guy, I think from Utah, killed a turtle. <laughs> I mean, I didn't want him to die for me. Jesus is hard enough, but turtles. But anyway, he killed this turtle and stuffed him and made a little gate post and nailed him on the top of the gate post and he sent it to me. He thought I'd be really pleased and I'd put it in my study and look at it every day and remember that if you see a turtle on a gate post, you know he doesn't get there by himself. And I thought, I ain't watching a dead turtle every day of my life. So you know what I did? I called the youth pastor. <laughs> he came in and said, what's that? I said, it's a dead turtle on a gate post. And he said, way cool, can I have it? <laughs> and he did. When you see a turtle on a gatepost, you know he didn't get there by himself. And then I got one other thing. Some of you are saying, look, I get that. I mean, I know what you just taught us is true, but you don't even do it. How can you expect us to do it? How, how, do, you, how do you turn control over the stuff you want to control? I'm going to teach you a technique, and I'm going to tell you what I do, and I want to be honest with you to say this works. Almost every morning of my life, I make a list of the things I want to control. I want to control my reputation. I want to control my family. I want to control what people say about me. Uh, we were talking about the internet this morning, Kevin and I. And I said, one of my students went on the internet to look up my name and interrupted my lecture and said, Dr. Brown, they don't like you. They don't like you at all. And I want to control that. I want to get a company that will fix that on the internet so people say nice things about me. I want to control my goods. I want to control my house. I don't want a hurricane to hit it. I've been there and I've done that. I want to control my family and my wife and my kids and my grandchildren and the church and the ministry that God has given me and my schedule. I want, and, I, and it's a long list because I'm a controlling person. So I make the list. And then at the end, I lift it before God, and I say, all right, I, I, I give it to you. It's your, I want you, I give it to you. I, whatever you do, whenever you do it, however you do it, you're God, I'm not, I don't get a vote. You can have every bit of it, and you can kill me if you want to. And then I say, but God, you know that I struggle. And you know that as a living sacrifice, I don't do very well. 
because I keep crawling off the altar. So what I want you to do is to make this into a formal contract before you, no matter what I say or what I do. And then I want you to begin to conform my heart to that contract. That is so freeing. It is, I have to do it every day. It is so freeing. It releases everything. I don't hold on to things, so, and I don't give a rip what you think about me. I don't care. Well, that's not true, but not as much as I used to. It's not mine. I don't own, the, I don't own this farm. It's his farm. And it is a great load off my shoulders. Then what do you do? Haven't you been listening? Nothing. <laughs> Don't you hate it? Now, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about an attitudinal thing. Nothing. You just give it to him, and you pray, and you wait, and you watch. God loves your kids and your family and your business and your goods and your church more than you do, and you can trust him. We, uh, we interviewed uh, Sally Lloyd-Jones, what is it, a couple of weeks ago? And Kevin came in for the talk show. We love it when he's on with us. And uh, she wrote the Jesus Storybook Bible that is so good. Uh, one of our guys, uh, Zach Van Dyke, says whenever he prepares a sermon, he always checks that children's Bible first because it is so grace saturated. But she, uh, she wrote a new book, and that was what we were interviewing her about. She's English, talks funny, but she's a delight. And the name of the new book is Poor Doreen, A Fishy Tale. And so Kevin asked her, said, Sally, where did you come up with this story? Where, uh, where, how, do you, how do you write these kinds of stories? She said to Kevin and to all of us, I don't know. She said, I had this wonderful children's story, and I was almost finished with it. And then this crazy fish showed up and changed everything. I thought about that since she said it. Once you do the discipline to give it to him, then this crazy God shows up who loves you, the God you can trust to really be in control. You think about that. Amen.